I am lucky. I get to travel the world with Refugees International, and I return home. The people I meet make me laugh and cry, fill me with all kinds of emotion, and are displaced. As a journalist, I was trained to stand apart, not to become part of a story. I find that almost impossible to do that now. Let me tell you why. In November 2014, I visited both the Kurdistan part of Iraq and Jordan to meet with Syrians who were part of the diaspora of war. Some carefully planned their exit. Others took flight carrying whatever they could as cluster bombs fell like rain around them. And for others, there was no choice. I will call her Amina. I met her in Amman, Jordan, at a hospital run by Syrian doctors and staff who were also refugees. Amina, 27, lay paralyzed from the neck down, all because she had reached out to save a 14-year-old boy from being taken away by a soldier at a checkpoint inside Syria. As she tried to grab the boy, she felt the butt of a rifle, cracking several vertebrae in her spine. She was eight months pregnant at the time. The baby arrived safely and is living back in Syria with Amina's husband. When I met Amina, she was in the hospital for seven months already. Doctors were trying to convince her to have plastic surgery to cover up her severe bed sores, but she was not ready. Yet, it is Amina's dream that when she gets better, that she become a nurse to help other Syrians. Said her doctor, Amina is a determined young lady and brave. She did not even know the name of the boy she reached out to save. Here's a toast, says Syrian clarinetist Keenan Asme at a Save the Children concert. Here's a toast to all those young people who have managed to fall in love and marry during the past five years of war. For love, after all, is one of the human rights that no one can take away from you. Keenan is right. At Jordan Zadari camp, there are 80,000 Syrians living there now, 3,000 new businesses, and a, an economy that generates 13 million a month for refugees and the local Jordanians. There are pizzerias and auto parts stores. There are bakeries and barber shops. But the most popular of all are the wedding shops. Fancy dresses adorned with crystals and crinolines rent for $12 a piece, and even local Jordanians come by to shop there. With about 80 babies born a day and 10 weddings a week, the camp surges with life, and you feel the pulse when you're there. Yet there's a sad underbelly to the high number of younger and younger marriages. Mm -hmm. Parents force their daughters into marriage because they fear for their daughter's future and their un own uncertain lives. In all, about 23% of female Syrian refugees are child brides. But look, in another corner of the camp, there's a production of King Lear going on with 100 youngsters in the cast and hundreds more coming to the show. The last production brought the house down and brought many to tears. So here's my toast to the many Syrians who are making the most of their lives on the run, that they may also be able to go home someday. I've been at this a long time. My first trip with Refugees International was in 2001 to Mandukiri in the eastern portion of Cambodia to help returning Pol Pot era refugees. Last year, at this time, I was standing on the shores of Lesbos, Greece, as deflated dinghies crammed with 40 to 50 men, women, and children edged closer 
reaching out for outstretched arms to save them. But most of all, I remember my trip in 2001, where I met a Madonna in the desert, a woman regal and beautiful, carrying a baby, wearing a thin blue shawl in the sands of Darfur, Sudan. She had no home. The Janjaweed had burned that. She had no idea of her future. No one around her did. But she was proud and brave and trusting that she too would go home someday. It's time to recognize the dignity and resilience of those who are displaced. It is our shame if we forget. Thank you.